Hi, everybody. It's Bob Ost. It's Friday. It's um, it's Yom Kippur, actually. So uh, Lashana Tova, this is like the, the, the last 24 hours that we can wish everybody a happy new year, technically speaking. Um, but uh, it's uh, October 11th. And uh, this is true, Theater Resources Unlimited. If you're stumbling upon us in YouTube and you don't know who we are, I will tell you, uh, we're a not-for-profit organization. We're an art services organization that I created 32 years ago. Yes, 32 years ago. Those of you who are going, why haven't I heard, heard about you after, for, after all this time? My only answer is I have no idea. We've been doing it. We're here. <laughs> we're here and, and we're, we've been helping people basically navigate the business of theater. And uh, we've been trying to uh, produce producers, I guess is what we say. We, let, we, we have a, a, a couple of programs in which we try to develop producers. Um, the average person who, who goes to theater doesn't really know what a producer does or they or they think that a, that a producer basically what waves a magic wand and, and theater happens there suddenly there's a broadway show and uh, there's a lot more to it and uh, it takes a lot of skills and a lot of training and we're here to help as many people who are interested in being producers to become effective and successful producers so that's who we are who are you um if you uh want to uh, be part of this and come into our room at some point and, and be part of this conversation, um, you can always email me at trunltd at aol.com and we'll send you a Zoom week link every week, trunltd at aol.com. Why do we do this? Um, if, you've, if you've been with us before, you've heard this, but I'll say it for those of you who don't know us. Um, this started April 17th, 2020. Uh, People were in shutdown. Everybody remember shutdown? We're not in shutdown anymore. Something to do with COVID. Everybody remember COVID? You might as well, because I know as many people who have it now as had it four years ago. But uh, at least we're not in shutdown. So uh, when we when that happened, I had a, a choice. It's like, close my company or open a Zoom, a Zoom room. So here we are. I opened a Zoom room, and people have been coming in this is the 231st consecutive week of doing these. Uh, and we talked about everything I can possibly think of. And I've brought as many interesting people in as I could find. Some that I knew, some that I just harassed. Um, and we've been doing this successfully and having uh, people come in and week after week. And the other thing about Zoom is that this little company that you never heard of, that was a New York centric art services organization called Theater Resources Unlimited. Suddenly we were on Zoom and accessible to people from all over the country and all over the world. So I kind of was very resistant to the idea like four and a half years ago that we could be a global, have a global footprint. I thought that was the silliest thing I ever heard. Um, but here we are now and we've got people who come from Australia, UK, Germany, Malaysia, San Francisco, Canada. Um, and uh, I'm very proud of this, of having built a, a community of people that is not just located in New York City. Um, so um, our conversations have changed. We're now in a world that is trying hard to imitate what the world used to be before COVID. It's trying really hard. Uh, some ways it's successful. Theater is still having a little bit of a struggle, but we're talking about theater again, and we're talking about things that we that we knew of and knew about before we were forced to shut our doors and go into quarantine. Um, so I've had many, many conversations, 231 of them, if you, if you remember what I said before, 231 conversations about different aspects of theater. Um, there's... There's something about service. Um, I'm, this is a service in, in a business that I have. Uh, we are into helping people. And that's why we're a 501c3. But also, uh, when the funders want to know who we are and what we do, we say that we're services to the field, which is different from a company that produces shows. Uh, and service is something that means a whole lot to me. And we have a benefit coming up and we look for people to honor every year. Uh, well, we had them for the past four years, but 
before COVID we did, now we're coming back. And I'm always happy and excited to meet people who have had a life of service, who have done things for the business. Um, these are a lot of times they're unsung heroes. So uh, we're hoping to sing them now. And I want to meet you. I want, I want to meet you. I want, to, I want you to meet um, my guest today, who is Susan Lee, uh, who I've known since almost the beginning of True. Um, Susan, I don't know if you remember. I, I'm pretty sure it was Randall Reggett who put me. It is. In, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he con connected with me with you. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started True, everybody who doesn't know us, we did monthly meetings and we would mm -hmm. sit around and we'd find things to talk about that had to do with theater. And I think you were part of a marketing panel, mm -hmm. weren't you? I was. Um, so um, all these years later, you've done a whole lot of stuff and we're going to talk a little bit about it. Susan Lee, just to give you a little, little bit, a little tip of the iceberg, um, she created something called Camp Broadway. Um, those of you who don't know what it is, um, it's been an opportunity for young people to experience theater and to be brought into the, into the theater and and the arts and at, at a at a level at a at a gut level at a, at a participatory level. Um, for, and she's also over the, over the years done um, created something called the Broadway Education Alliance. And uh, when she worked with the Nederlanders, she did something. Um, spectacular she came up with the idea of let's give awards to young people who are just new to theater and coming into theater so there are performer awards that are given every year that you may not have heard of or you may have heard of called the jimmies named for jimmy ne niederlander uh, but the jimmy awards were susan and um in more recent years she's created something the rob the, the uh, roger reese awards mm -hmm. um it all revolves around serving the community and also it revolves around an understanding uh, that you had even before i had of how important it is to prepare for the future and that our future really depends on young people mm -hmm. so susan that was a lot of introduction so say hello to, to to my my community and our and our viewers out there well, Bob, thank you so much for inviting me. I um, am really honored to know you at this stage because we were both young once. I remember that it was one of the early, early, early um, true meetings. And in those days, the word marketing was not ever used in the theater industry. I remember producers at that time saying to me, well, Susan, if you have to like promote it, then there's something wrong. And I kept saying, no, I think marketing is really about good communication to audiences, right? And how the world has changed. But I'm so delighted to meet so many of your members and so many of your guests that are um, your members who are on this call today, because unlike all of you, um, I wanted, I decided that um, I was going to work in the theater when I was seven years old. And I told my parents that I was going to work in the theater. And they were horrified because, of course, I had no talent whatsoever. And so it was just sort of my lot in life that I wanted to work in service of connecting artists like so many of you to audiences, because I was one of those kids who just loved it. I didn't want to ever be on the stage, but I wanted to make this world um, of arts and artistry and crafts and creativity just available because I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And as I um, now some, you know, 40 years later, as I look back on my career, that connection, creating connection between artists and audiences is really what I've done my whole life. I just didn't write or sing or dance or choreograph, but I tried to get fancy people in the theater business to invest in systems and processes that would make the arts more accessible. So I guess that's how you describe most of the things that I've done in my career. We'll get into some specifics, but I just wanted to um echo what you were saying. I, when I was a kid, I also knew I wanted to be in theater, which completely bewildered my parents. I never really thought of, I was very shy. 
So I never thought of getting on a stage, but I was a writer and mm -hmm. I actually read plays before I read books. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, I, I kind of think, uh, you know, it was destiny that mm -hmm. I eventually found my way to whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm doing now. <laughs> well, I, I was lucky enough. My parents took me to the theater as the way that's how so many folks were um, originally enchanted by the art form. But I, I just remember the moment and I thought, this makes sense to me. I'm going to work in service of enabling this really cool thing in this really cool world uh, to happen. So um, I talked my way into my first job at the um, what is now the Benetton Center in Pittsburgh. And um, I started as the house manager where um, Richard Kiley in Man of La Mancha was playing. And then I met um, Mitch Lee, who was the producer of the um, King and I. And he said, kid, I like you. You've got grit. How would you like to work on my new show with Yul Brenner and the King and I? And so I moved to New York and started as a receptionist. And within six months, I was out on the road as the advanced person for Yul Brenner traveling around the country. And what was interesting for me then is I got to travel from city to city to city to find out just how many people around America loved Broadway. And I was able to move to New York with that show. And what amazed me when I got here is that the producers just thought that New York was the center of the universe. And I kept saying, but there are all of these people around the country who just love it. We just have to build more bridges to them. And that's how I ended up as the director of road resources at what was then the the League of um, American Theaters and Producers. So when did, I did, did they already have that position? Did they they had that it? position, okay. but um, the, a person who had it, they had just really become changed from the League of New York Producers to the League of American Theaters and Producers. And when I started, they had twelve road members, and when I left, they had four hundred. So I would just call up all the theaters around the country and tell them that they needed to be a member of this organization. And I started, um, I did the first press list of drama critics around the country. Um, I did uh, Stage Specs book, which was referenced earlier. So I just started to try to connect the Broadway producers to the theaters around the country that were presenting shows. And if you fast forward what is now 30 or 40 years, the road has become such an economic engine for New York. And indeed, it's not just the road anymore, it's Broadway all around the world. Um, but everything- well, the, the, other, the other thing that, that's, that's worth mentioning is that um, we used to have something called pre-Broadway tryouts um, oh, that's yeah. how that's mm -hmm. how shows eventually found their way to I'm I'm from Philadelphia, so I know pre-Broadway mm -hmm. tryouts. Mm -hmm. I saw Bajor in a pre-Broadway yeah. tryout. That's um, right. But what's what's happened now, thank God you you built you built a structure that has wound up being essential for the business mm -hmm. because the, the business model now is mm -hmm. collaborating mm -hmm. with the regional theaters. Mm -hmm. the, um, enhancement deals and whatever and the performing shows are arts centers that's right right Sh mm -hmm. shows are, are mm -hmm. basically we don't have pre-broadway tryouts anymore we have we have regional theater productions and developmental productions outside you of have a few because you have presenters so going back to that time we we um i was on the team that produced the first road conference right so we brought all the theaters together with all the producers together and you know, we did the first membership directory so that people could know who else was in the organization. Because, you know, 40 years ago, Broadway was New York. And even though folks like me from around the country loved it, the industry really thought of itself is as a kind of New York centric idea. And then there was a whole different group of people who would produce the tours and send them out. Well, now it's a much more holistic industry. Right. So the performing arts center movement is really only about 40 years old. Right. And out of that became the independent presenters network who started to sort of um, combine their resources to provide anchor investment for a lot of tours. So when you think about it, the Broadway industry, as we know it today, is still relatively young. And so um, 
in my capacity, I stayed at the Broadway League for about seven or eight years. So I don't know if some of you remember when we closed down Times Square and put on a big show called Broadway on Broadway. So I was behind um, that idea. I was um, behind the 100th anniversary of Broadway. So I really was um, at, even in those early years, I was really thinking about Broadway as a brand and Broadway as a national or international brand and an art form that people really love. Now, everybody talks about that now, but I got into a lot of trouble in those days talking about it, talking about it as a brand. But I think what time has proven is that, you know, musical theater or Broadway is something that, you know, people all over the country fall in love with and they fall in love with it. And those days through cast recordings, now it's films or streaming. There's a lot of other ways for it to be ac accessible. But I just think for all of you um, who are members of True, and for me, this is the uh, an amazingly exciting time for our industry because it's being reinvented. Some of the bad habits of old are going away. We're being forced to really think about innovation, technology, distribution systems, rights management. Um, there are now many, many more opportunities for um, cross-platform work. And so I'm, you know, even though I'm sort of at the end of my big chapter in my career, I'm really excited about what the future looks like. And, it, and everything we do is about connecting artists and audiences. So that's sort of the, the through line of everything I've done. I think we can safely say that New York theater industry has more than embraced the concept of branding. Uh, Broadway has become a brand, mm -hmm. which has some pluses and minuses to it because it's mm -hmm. it's one of the things that the challenges for smaller um, theater theaters in mm -hmm. the cities. I think they're still trying to find a way of branding themselves. Off Broadway is not a good brand. It just means you're not Broadway. Um, and we've 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 had conversations about that with other with other people. You, you... Uh, brand to, a brand is more than a name, and a brand is a consumer promise, right? So it almost doesn't matter what the name is, as long as it means something, and it means something very relevant to the audiences. So I'm going to push back a little bit on the off Broadway brand idea. I think there are so many young. Um, um, adventurous theater goers. And I always thought that off Broadway's brand should be about adventurous theater going. And a well, there's been, there's been a, 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 a there's been yeah. an attempt to, to rebrand it for years now. I've been involved with it for yeah. 20 years. Indie theater. We've been trying to make it indie theater. Um, yeah. Because we thought that it, it would have, it would suggest something that would be comparable to what you have in, in with indie films. Um hmm. Which is similar to what you're saying, but it, but if you have a better way of doing it, yeah, I have lots of people that are willing to listen to that. Right. Well, that's a very different conversation, but but you're right that you know brands are more than logos, right? And so often we get caught up in oh well, what's the artwork look like? You know, so there's a lot of pretty artwork where the shows never ended up becoming brands, right? So I think sometimes in the theater we misuse those terms. Um, we sometimes confuse. We call everything marketing, but sometimes it's just promotion. So, you know, that's a whole other conversation. But I think in terms of um, what's exciting is that it's there's nothing but opportunity now for for artists to be discovered, for audiences to find things that really resonate with them. And I think um, that starting younger is a real opportunity. And again, even, even there, you know, high school, we talked to you, you referenced the Jimmy Awards. So the Jimmy Awards was actually an insight that came out of Camp Broadway. So I'd started Camp Broadway really 30 years ago. It's hard to believe because I wanted, I loved Broadway and I wanted to create that experience for kids that was absolutely authentic. The kids could come from anywhere in the world. If they just loved it, they didn't need to be the next Bernadette Peters. If they just wanted to love it and it was a safe place for kids to come and learn from Broadway professionals 
what it meant to put on these shows, how these shows are created, what goes on behind the scenes of um, um, on Broadway shows. And that was 30 years ago. We, we've had about, we were the first to create the pre-show workshops. We were the first to develop curriculum for schools around shows. Um, we've had about 500,000 kids come to our camps or our workshops or our experiential events. But the insight there was that, you know, kids somehow or another discover it when they're little and they fall in love with it. And if we nurture that and give them opportunities for them to engage meaningfully and kindly, enthusiastically, that's how you develop lifelong theater habits. That's how you discover artists. So um, Frank DeLello went to Camp Broadway, Greg Noble, who's a producer, went to Camp Broadway, Ali Stoker, who wanted Tony, went to Camp Broadway. So it was never our intention to encourage kids to go into the industry, but I'm really proud of the fact that so many kids that work in the industry work in all facets of it because of something that they learned or somebody that they met when they went to Camp Broadway. I want to pull on a thread there because I, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that's, that I get very frustrated about, um, which is arts and education. Um, mm. Basically, um, I uh, you can disagree with me or agree with me. I, I, I don't see the, the United States, our country, as being particularly supportive of, of arts and particularly encouraging uh, young people to go into the arts. I, I don't see it. Uh, I, I feel like it's something that's missing in our country that, mm -hmm. that I think you see in other countries mm -hmm. much more clearly. And mm -hmm. um, what you're talking about are, are basically mm -hmm. um, things that you've created Mm -hmm. To to that have that, that have necessarily compensated for the fact that children aren't really introduced to to the arts mm -hmm. in in school. Well, can I give you a little background on that that might inform that thinking? So yeah, sure. This is so I'm again, willing to be wrong. No, no, no. You're <laughs> you're not wrong, but sometimes understanding why you're right is is important to help change the narrative. So, just a couple of couple of insights. That, um, that might be inspiring to some of you. So when you think about it, the National Standards for Education for the Arts was only established in 1994, which was literally 60 years after the National Standards were designed for music and visual arts. That's why music programs or visual arts programs are typically the only arts that you find in schools. So that wasn't that long ago. And then it was in 2014, which was really only 10 years ago, that the national standards for arts education was established, which has now been adopted in I think 47 states around the country. Now, I tell you that because that's really, really good news and an insight into how we're just at the foothills of what can be a whole new chapter for connecting artists and, and audiences. And a couple of other stats that might um, give you some context for this. So pre-pandemic school systems spent about nine billion with a B dollars a year in um, educational technologies, right? And of that money that went into four buckets, um, hardware, I don't care too much about hardware, software, I care a little bit about, professional development, I care a lot about, and content, I care all about, right? So about 70% of the money that goes into content for schools is in the category of English language arts, which it won't take us very long for all of the creative people in your organization to recognize how well aligned so much of the arts can be to English language arts. But it it's only now in the last five or six years post pandemic 
that the digital technologies provide these sort of super highways that enable us to create real content that can go into in school and out of school. So I wanna to say to you, and I'll share this story with you. I was talking to a procurement officer from a very large school district in Texas. And he said to me, Susan, I'll never be fired. Um, I'll never, I, I can put money into anything I can get a trophy for. And that was actually part of the inspiration for the National High School Musical Theater Awards, which has now become the Jimmy Awards. Because essentially, if I were to boil all the issues down to one in the, in the reason that arts education is not in more schools, and it's because we're hard for schools to procure goods and services at scale. Does that make sense? There is no, another procurement officer said to me, Susan, I'll never be fired buying science curriculum from NASA. There is no equivalent in the arts. So as I look at my 40 year career and what I'm gonna spend the rest of my life doing, it's really the way to connect artists and audiences is to create the necessary infrastructure for discoverability. And that I think is where innovation, where technology, where new business development, where all of those things come from. Because if you can't align the arts content with standards, there's the, it, it can't get into the schools. So mm -hmm. being able to do that is really game changing for our sector. And I'm really excited about it. Well, yeah, that's a lot of, those are, those are things that I didn't really know about. I, I have to say that the, the reason why I just as I've always assumed that we neglect arts in schools is because um, number one, I, I almost never hear a politician talk about supporting the arts in any in any speech. Um, mm -hmm. It's like it's like the last thing on their list of things they might mention. Mm -hmm. And the other the other thing is that I I just don't see um, I don't see programs that, that are I I see arts programs as being the first things that are always cut from schools. Um, that's well, at least good. that's that's what we're told. That's what we hear. That's what we're hearing, but. But in fact, there's a lot of um, research and then there's, the good news is now, there's also bodies of research that are validating the role that arts engagement and arts education has long-term on student outcomes. So in fact, there's a, a new book that's just on the market now. It's called um, Why Theater Education Matters by Thalia Goldstein. Check it out. Okay, I want everybody to buy that book. Yeah. Everybody in this room. Check it out. And and so the good news is, Bob, and this is what I want, this is what I want to be encouraging. You're absolutely right. For years and years and years, all you would hear about is, you know, arts being cut. I would actually say there's wonderful practitioners around the country of really amazing, the performing arts centers, the regional theaters, community theaters. There's a lot of really wonderful programming. There just isn't the journalism to cover it. That's one. Secondly, we don't have a big enough megaphone to talk about these programs in a meaningful way. So it all gets back to scale because artists are really, really, really busy and, and several of your members talked about it before, they're really busy creating work, but I think the people who create work need to be supported by organizations like yours and mine and others who are in the business of facilitating information about that work. And I think that's the investment that the industry needs to, to, um, to make, to put more time and effort into. And I don't think it's the artist's job to invest in that infrastructure. So um, I'll give you another example. So Audience Rewards, which is the loyalty program on Broadway, um, came out of an insight that Jimmy Niederlander said to me on my very first day on the job. I said to him, Jimmy, what do you want me to do? And he said, Susan, we have theaters all over the country and I want everybody to know that if they go to one Niederlander theater that we'll take care of them at another theater, right? And I said, well, Jimmy, that's great, but there's no system in place to do that, right? There wasn't connected websites. There wasn't, there just wasn't a way to do it. So 
I, you know, I did my homework and at the time, is anybody on the call? Are, are you in a points junkies? So baby boomers typically built the loyalty industry. And I read an article at the time that said there were 14 trillion points in circulation and 14 trillion points at the time translated into $700 million in unredeemed liability on corporate America's books. And the loyalty industry had a problem. And the problem was, is that they didn't want, consumers didn't want to buy golf clubs anymore or coffee pots. They wanted experiences. So I called the head of the loyalty industry and I said, I'm in the experience business. How do I get that $700 billion in resources applied to people change? you know, taking their points to buy theater tickets. And that's how Audience Rewards started. And um, they said I was crazy at the time. And now Audience Rewards has three, mil three and a half million members around the country who earn and burn their points for theater tickets. But that was because Jimmy Niederlander and a cohort of other theater owners were willing to invest in the infrastructure to connect the loyalty industry to our industry. So it isn't glamorous, but it does now sell a lot of tickets. We'll continue the bad cup, good cup thing here. And um, the other thing I wanted to, to, to mention is the fact that um, in commercial, in the commercial theater, there was a lot of frustration. Um, well, there's a lot of frustration because it's so difficult to, to, to afford to be able to put anything on. But yeah. the other thing that, about that that's unique in our country and not necessarily positive is that there's very little uh, government support of the arts um, in, in relation to other countries and sure. theater in particular. Mm -hmm. um, we, theater, shows are, are produced in, in the UK uh, and many of them have mm -hmm. an amazing amount of, of government mm -hmm. support that makes it possible. We don't have that here. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that, I still don't think, I think that there are mechanisms and you're talking about there being mechanisms and I'm, Mm -hmm. very grateful to hear that there are mechan mechanisms in in, uh, in play but in general it seems there's a lot of, there's a big degree of frustration about the fact that we don't have as much support as we think mm -hmm. other countries might have mm -hmm. um and that also uh that, that also refers back to to the, the to the school issue which which mm -hmm. you're saying is not necessarily as big an issue as i think it is well, it um, isn't that it's not a big issue. It's that the 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 universe is conspiring to make the change, the necessary change to provide the context and the opportunity and indeed the funding to be able to really put arts in schools in a more meaningful, scalable way, right? So I, I want to distinguish between the development of audiences and the development of art of, of work. That's hilarious. That's exactly what I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, because like, I'm not, I mean, I guess I could have been a producer. I, I, that was not where my passions lie. My passion um, was really around getting kids mostly to be able to have these important experiences. And I think whether you're, and I mean kids of all ages, really it's about the theater is part of a, is part of how one defines themselves. It's, it's like, I just think the theater is essential to living and breathing and, and, you know, it's, it's essential to me and it's essential to other people who have had the opportunity to be exposed in it and changed by it. And so my interest is in doing a lot is enabling more people of every age to find a point of entry, right? And I think it's, if that is a positive experience, then they're more likely to do it again and again. So early in my early, you know, when I was at the league, I guess I was just, you know, in my early twenties, I started talking about how we needed to be nicer to patrons. Remember those conversations a million years ago? Customer service was part of that equation. If people spent a lot of time and effort coming and they had a bad time, they weren't gonna come again. So 
all the the entire experience, the experience starts when they leave their driveway. It doesn't start when they get to the theater door. And if at any time it breaks down, it impacts somebody's feeling, you know, and but but when they get into the theater and they have a transformative experience, they're going to want another one. And I think everybody on this call and, you know, your members are probably all invested in getting more people to have that positive experience. And I'm excited about how many different channels there are now for us to be talking about that in a meaningful way. There, there's still there's still a, a, a little bit of a stumbling block, um, which is basically, and this goes back to what you were saying about let's let's separate developing future audiences from developing future artists. There's mm -hmm. a, there's a, an obvious or art att work. attraction. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. I'm sorry. Or the art the the production. So there's artists. There's the audience. There's artists, and then there's their outcome, which is their production. And I think there are three very different development processes. Well, I think that one of the one of the telltale problems um, is that uh, it's it's kind of I kind of hear it all the time. I, I assume that it's true. You might have different information. Producers in New York have a difficult time getting young people into theater. The, the, the pr predominant audiences in, in New York theater tend to be older audiences, mm -hmm. and one of the answers that they thought they had was, oh, interactive. Young people like to be involved in interactive. They don't mm -hmm. want to sit and watch a play. They want to be something mm -hmm. that's interactive. So then we did, they they brought um, Here Lies Love uh, mm -hmm. it, into a commercial production on, on Broadway, and it didn't do what they hoped it would, it would mm -hmm. do. Um, I think the problem is that we're not getting kids interested in theater uh, at, at a young enough age they, it, it, it's foreign to them. Theater is still an elitist art form to, to the average person. Well, Broadway might be, but theater can happen anywhere. Yeah, but they only Broadway know Broadway because Broadway, Broadway has so successfully branded itself that that's what people think of it when they think of theater. Well, I think Broadway is an aspiration, but, you know, I think the issue isn't about interactivity. I think it's about relevance, right? And I would argue that Hannah Montana and Glee and Smash and these TV shows that made theater cool has contributed as much to kids wanting to break into song, right? Because it's cool, right? So I think it's about exposure and relevance. If you send a kid to a great show that has no relevance to them, they're not going to be interested, right? So I think it's it, there, there isn't any one issue is you have to have a relevant show that they're going to want to see. It, you have to be able to communicate that. You have to have communications channels to get them to learn about it. And nowadays, everybody's attention is so limited. And, you you know, it used to be you'd have to tell somebody something seven or eight times to get them to take an action or clock it. Now I think it's 20 sometimes because people don't have the attention span. It's very difficult to have any marketing channel that actually delivers actionable information. You know, people don't read anymore. I mean, I think the biggest challenge in the industry today are communications channels. How do we market the shows? That's where I would like to see a lot of innovation. And if we could have, while while we were all in lockdown, if we had had a lot more conversations about how do we change the narrative around how do we market the industry, that would have been a conversation I would have liked to have had. Okay, I, I'm, I'm trying to be hopeful. <laughs> I'm trying. Hopeful? My, I'm trying best. I I I still have a, a little nagging frustration about the fact that I think I think that we're I think that we're we're doing a good job at building the the theater uh, artists of tomorrow i'm mm -hmm. not sure whether we're whether being a successful in building the audiences of tomorrow tomorrow i agree and, you, I agree. and you've, ta you've talked about a lot of different mm -hmm. different yeah. things that that can help yeah um i just think that there's a basic I, I don't know maybe i know you're trying to talk me out of this i still still think there's a basic um lack of interest in 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 the arts and in, in young people uh, and i think it has to do with the environment and schools and right. and and Ron DeSantis probably. 
Right. Well, I'm going to say it's lack of infrastructure, not lack of interest. I mean, look at TikTok. I mean, TikTok is its own, like kids are creating, kids really like. It's a different art form. It's no longer theater. And 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 so we need, we might have to rethink what we call theater, right? uh, So, because all of it is on a continuum. It isn't, theater isn't just one thing. And so I think it's about that kind of openness. You have to make it available. Um, You know, I'm sure you all know our tagline at Camp Broadway is develop your character because we could, you know. That's great. I love that. Little characters start to develop very little, right? And you can see it and parents can see it. And I think, you know, um, I, I I literally meet parents all the time. They'll say they have three sports kid and then this theater kid came into their lives. They don't know how, they don't know when, but that parent is interested in, in helping those kids be passionate about that passion as they are about kicking a ball. And I think the whole education system realizes that not every kid kicks a ball. So I think that, you know, when I, after all the experiences that I've had in the years and all of the successful ventures that I've been a part of, it all comes back to the same thing is that you have to be able to do, you have to be able to, to do whatever you're doing at scale these days, right? I think it's really hard for individual artists to break through an arts education situation. The industry needs a sector solution for scaling. Do you know there is not one single publisher for arts education curriculum in the world? Did you know that? No, I had no idea. But imagine if there was one. Imagine if that organization worked in service to all of these shows. Um, again, it's it's an investment in infrastructure. That sounds like something that 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 one should uh, propose to Scholastic. Well, Scholastic doesn't do it anymore. Um, that's one of the things that we're working on, which is why I I have some of these facts and figures because I wanted to understand. Like Bob, I started where you started. I want you know all my life I heard well just their the artists arts is the first thing to go. So I wanted to know why. So I through. Does everybody remember Arnie Duncan, who was the secretary of education under Obama? So the folks that were his advisors were helping me understand what the problems are. And um, and they actually were very helpful and useful. They said, it's not that there isn't interest and it's not really that there isn't resources. There weren't standards to align to. That problem has been solved. There weren't... Um, there isn't if if ever like schools don't buy textbooks anymore they buy subscriptions into digital libraries right there isn't a digital library for the arts so it's not that they don't want it it's just they don't know where to get it right and therefore everything is local so i think that there's a that's a solvable problem well, we've got to find somebody to do it. <laughs> I don't think I have the time to take it on. <laughs> no, no, we we are taking it on. So, like, I think, I mean, this is the this is the enterprise solution that we're that we're working on. Is it's a it's a business development exercise with a arts education outcome, and you know, it's a myriad of things that need to be put together from rights management. Just think about that rights management, technology, um, standards alignment, meta tagging. There's a lot of technical things that go into solving that problem. But all of those things, here's, if if I leave you with this, um, the theater industry has what I call the last to market advantage, right? And that means that billions of dollars has been spent by lots of other industries to figure out how to do this. We don't have to spend that money. We have to learn from that exercise and apply those, um, apply those things to the arts. And somebody asked a question, is standards another way of saying monetize? monetize? And the answer is no. Standards are what the government establishes as an alignment of any activity that happens in school. So there is a standard for um, for um, 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 
I'm trying to think of something off the bat. Um, so there are standards for, for, for teaching dance. So if there's going to be a dance class that can go into the school, the outcome of that dance class has to align to that standard. So it's well established now and it's, it's in, in law in 47 states in America. The English have their own standards. The Australians have their standards. There are standards of education in every country on the globe. We just have to align to what their requirements are. And that's a function that the arts hasn't had at scale. So you, you indicated the Scholastic once did this, then they stopped so doing Scholastic, it. Scholastic is a publisher. Right. Yeah. And remember when we were kids, you'd go into a doctor's office and you'd see the little scholastic. Well, they don't. They were, they were a client of mine when I had an advertising agency. That's why I thought of them. Yeah. So but but scholastic actually. So think of what we're doing as the scholastic equivalent for arts education. It's becoming a publisher that produces a certain kind of work. Um, but scholastic would occasionally have arts education, but not usually. They were more aligned with English language arts standards. Um, well, uh, Jay, what, why don't you be the voice of God and, and uh, bring in, uh, I don't think Arlene had a question. She had a comment. or uh, but Kip uh, has I, I had a few from Kip. Yeah. So uh, Kip asks uh, two questions. Uh, what does the future look like uh, in a school using the system you'd like to build and scale? Can you paint uh, paint for oh, us in an yes. example? Yes, yes, yes. So um, if we had, if an enterprise existed that was in the, whose specialty was providing arts education that can scale in a couple of ways. Number one, a teacher now doesn't have a textbook. They have a smart board on their, in their front of the class and they're accessing their lesson plans through their content management system. So let's say uh, a teacher was teaching um, early American history, right? That aligned to early American history standards might be a lesson plan that involved ragtime, for example, right? So think of it as you have to, the teachers go into a big database and they find lesson plans that align to what they have to teach. Right now, they're not being served up arts education content. So there's arts education and there's applied arts education. So the example I just gave was applying arts to other subject areas, right? Or another class, and we did many of these during the pandemic, we worked with a company and we sponsored 60 workshops that were done like Zoom in a way, that I had an artist in New York and they we had a lesson plan attached and an artist a, a school, a classroom could log on and have a Q and A with that, um, with that artist. That would be another rung. A third rung would be there's programming. We're working with Music Theater International right now to introduce a new 40 hour course or curriculum that teaches kids life skills through the learning of the fundamentals of musical theater. So all of these things are foundational, right? Um, that particular program is for middle and elementary school. So a lot of arts education programs start at the high school level. I contend we should be starting at the elementary school level. I agree. Because that's where if you get a child before the fifth grade, you can have them the rest of your life. By the time they reach high school, they're either gonna be interested or not. It's much harder to get more kids engaged. But I think the, the point that the, the question is, I could take any one of the shows that you guys are working on and find standards that um, could align with that, the, the themes or the scenes or the songs in those shows because teachers now are looking for creativity in their classroom, right? So the future of education is what they call learner-centered learning. So it's more the gamifying, which I, I am a little worried about. It's the gamifying. So kids can say, gee, I'm interested in this topic. And then they keep, there's, there is content that enables them to move up the in, their interest level, right? <clears throat> but this kind of innovation 
<clears throat> is happening in the schools. And, and Bob, to your point, the arts isn't keeping up. Well, that's, yeah, that's the concern because this whole uh, topic <laughs> today is really the future of theater. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what we're identifying are the way things that, things that need to be addressed in some way mm -hmm. so that we can be more, I, you know, for probably for, for 20 centuries, since, since the first play was, was done, people have been afraid that the theater was, was never going to survive. Mm -hmm. Um, and it always has. Um, I think one of the things he said earlier was that we may have to rethink what we do and how we do it. Um, what it means or how we define what it, it means. Yeah, I mean, if you look it. at, I mean, look at what's happening in popular, popular culture. Look at how many television shows now break into song. How many television commercials are back to little musical theater vignettes, right? Singing and dancing is no longer strange, right? And movies and television commercials. I mean, it's really much more popular than we give ourselves credit for. That's our art form. We just don't connect the dots well. You know, I want to go back to another point, too, because we're talking about uh, I think my conversation led into an, an assumption of the fact that it was only in uh, commercial Broadway theater <laughs> that we were having a hard time getting young people in. Mm -hmm. I would like to know. I don't know this for a fact, whether young people are attending more off off Broadway and off Broadway and independent theater and, and small small theater small theater companies with it. I don't have the answer to that, but I'm, I'm hoping that, that there is some, some more engagement because the other concern is really that we're going to have, that we will continue to have an audience. Um, right. Well, I mean, if, again, you, you're speaking specifically about New York, but when you think about. No, I was thinking, I was thinking, of, I was thinking about, about around the country, small theaters oh, around see. the country. Well, yeah. the, a lot of the, you know, it's funny, but the, the Performing Arts Center Network, which I think at the last league conference, there were like 700 theaters there, right? Which is really remarkable at the explosion of theaters happening around, around the country and indeed around the world. And those theaters, because they're in communities, they are making huge investments in building relationships with their school districts, in building relationships with families, in doing programming, whether it's after school or summer school. I mean, I think that, I, Bob, your, your initial point is you don't read about it enough. That is absolutely positively true. But I think there's a lot of, a lot of great work being done around the country in terms of really thinking about how do we build a new community of people who, of kids who like the theater, of teens who like the theater of how do we take the theater out of the building and go into the communities? I mean, that's what's so exciting about what's happening in the future is the walls are breaking down. You no longer have to go to a building at a particular time, sit in an uncomfortable seat and watch something, right? Theater can yeah. be found in many, many places. And I think- But, you can, but when you stream it, is it theater? It's theater. No, that it's a you, you, just, experience. you just hit one of the, one of the big things. Uh, the young, the younger audiences don't want to be told when when to see what they want to see. That's right. So, That's and right. theater, live theater, you have That's right. you have but to be the, there. But the digital experience does not cannibalize the live experience. It validates the live experience, and so and and there's lots of research about that, right? Um, well, the, the 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 streaming of Hamilton did did absolutely no harm to Hamilton as a Broadway. No, but it got show. kids all across America who may never see Hamilton live. They're singing that material, right? So I think the the opportunity. First of all, I'm really bullish about the future, and I hope you and your your colleagues are as well, because there are now so many more ways to find your audience. There's so many more ways to, um, so many more places to put your show, right? And not every show belongs in an off-Broadway theater or an off-off-Broadway theater or Broadway theater. Some shows belong in a library. Some shows, there's all different kinds of live experience. So I think, you know, we have an opportunity to think more broadly, to think, to, to be more welcoming. And that's what I'm encouraging folks to do. That's what I'm going to spend the rest of my time doing. I've interviewed a lot of different theater companies, including some site-specific theater companies, companies that travel around and bring, bring shows to 
to different mm -hmm. different sites and um everybody's having a degree of success i just think that theater deserves a bigger share of audience than, than we get we get we get enough to survive but but i i I, would, I wish there were a way of just convincing more people that it's a great it's great to have a live theater experience i just I, I'm I'm idealistic about that. Do, do, is it share of people or share of wallet or share of time? People. The people uh, getting enough people in. So more people, more people in more theaters is how. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah. Right. And I don't. I, I, don't I, want, I don't want. To, I don't want uh, that would that would translate into more money. But it, but the but the the key is the, is right, the audience. Right. The audience right. support the the, right. the 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 passion for theater that that, right. that we want to instill. And so my point is, in order to accomplish that task, we need more ways for people to learn about what's in those theaters and what that theater experience is and how it's different from other experiences that they can have. And I think that's the missing ingredient that we have an opportunity it's no one producer's job to do that. It's no one artist's job to do that. I don't think, I think we need to bring lots of organizations together to do that. Well, it sounds like something that's, that's, that's going to be, yeah. would be challenging. You know, I, I, I absolutely, one of your writers talked about the pharmaceutical companies. I wish they'd write better songs, um, but, but yes, like, People are seeing and dancing <laughs> everywhere. Right? You, didn't get, you didn't give her no. Lil says pharmaceutical companies are making TV commercials with and with musical theater songs and ruining my experience of the show. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh yes. Oh, I know what you mean now. Yes, you're absolutely right. But see, there must be something about the musical theater, the the stickiness of it, the memory that 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 it evokes for so many of these materials to be adapted. And then I will say too that. You know, the folks that have the music rights for those shows are finding very clever ways to monetize those music rights, which is all, which is the business of those of that. Uh, Jay, give us uh, uh, Kip's other question. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. uh, so his other question is your focus now about nailing down the uh, technical means to scale the delivery of the content to schools or engaging and contracting with schools and their decision makers or actually creating the content to be mm -hmm. deployed or something else? Well, that you, you've listed several pieces of the puzzle that all need to be properly aligned. I mean, ultimately we need an end-to-end -end solution that starts with the artist because essentially whatever happens, we have to protect their underlying rights, right? Then you have to have the content management system that is that can enable you to align that material to the standards, as well as create captioning, create um, the visual, how that material is going to be visually represented. Because if we do that right, if everybody gets a minute, go to a go to a website called Study Sync. And Study Sync is an example of a company that started to provide um, social studies education, right? You'll, you'll get it, you'll see what an outcome looks like in how schools are buying content now. But, but you're, you've, you, you can see just by the several things that you've listed, all of those things are part of an end-to-end -end solution. And each one of them has issues and challenges and opportunities. And so I feel reasonably confident, I'll never over promise, but I feel reasonably confident that the technology exists already. We don't need to be investing in new technology. We need to invest in stacking the right technology that is being used in schools, which is now mostly interoperable. So it used to be that you were a, the, the technology was very siloed, but there's been a whole movement, um, thanks in part to Arne Duncan, that it that technology is now a little bit more ubiqu uh, a little bit more um it all, it, no matter what system you're on, it can all um, feed feed in. But it's a, you know, creating that end-to-end -end solution takes time, investment, and some expertise that doesn't currently exist in the arts field. So we've been basically looking at the future of theater in terms of 
future the development of future artists mm -hmm. and the development of future audiences mm -hmm. um now we need to find some people that are going to actually be the the future um what what are we doing you and i <laughs> whatever we're doing we need more the, people that are doing it the future service providers the, the, the yeah well, the per, you know, future think, service providers yeah you know, i think look i um i think that the theater industry has gone through a really tough patch there's no doubt about it and you know it has you know funkered along for low these many decades but i think we're entering an era where people are trying to engage with other humans in a much more meaningful way. That parents are trying to get kids to put their phone down is that people are wanting to gather again. That I think that if we, we're, we're poised to have a new renaissance, right? But you mentioned something earlier, we can't go back to the way it used to be. We need to be really thinking about how people engage in content, how people engage with each other, what it takes to get them to go out of their home, what different types of experiences that there are. There are digital experiences and there are live experiences. One is not better than the other. Like I live up in Rhinebeck now. I lived, I spent 40 years, right? right. I could walk to Times Square from anywhere I lived. Now I live in Rhinebeck, right? Which is a two hour commute. So for me to go to a show at night, I don't get home till one o'clock in the morning. I now have a new appreciation for theater goers and what we put them through than I ever did before, right? So occasionally I'm happy to see a show digitally because I didn't want to miss it. So it's just, I've just added other um other ways of consuming theater to my theater portfolio, my consumption portfolio. And so I think we that these aren't better or worse experiences. These are just different. And they're different in terms of commitment from the consumer, the price barrier. And so I just think, you know, we have so many opportunities. We just now need to but it's hard to do everything by yourself because most theater companies are under human resourced and undercapitalized, right? So that becomes an even more critical role that service organizations play, or I call them shared service organizations. So maybe everybody doesn't have to invest in an accountant. Maybe a, a number of organizations are working with the same accountant. Do you see what I mean? It's that shared service model, which has really taken off in almost every other industry. Um, I get so frustrated. The thing that frustrates me is when everybody says, we don't do it that way, or they won't let us do it that way. And I always say, could you tell me who they is? I'd like to meet them and talk to them, you know? But, you know, we just have to think in a more um, creative and collaborative way. And sometimes, Theater organizations are not terribly collaborative with each other. Well, I think I'm going to wrap up, but I want to just say to the room, uh, do you have any other questions? I mean, now's the time to ask before I start doing my, my wrap up. Um, anybody? We've talked about a lot. Um, the, the, the heart of it really being uh, a, a concern about where where the theater of tomorrow is going to be supported, mm -hmm. how it's going to be, be supported. It's a, it's, it's a concern that's near and dear to me because I'm also thinking in terms of my organization. Mm -hmm. um, I, we have to bring in young people. We have to attract young people mm -hmm. in order for us to know that this is going to be, that mm -hmm. the true is going to be around in, in mm -hmm. 10 years. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a topic that's near and dear to me and yeah. a little, a little bit of a, it's got a little bit of a twinge about it. A little bit oh, of concern. there's so much to be enthusiastic about, Bob. And so now, now that we're collaborating again, we'll just one plus one can equal three. Okay, so we'll we will do, we'll, okay. Do you have do you have data on the growth of independent small theater groups for children? That's a great uh, a great question. So there are theater children's theater companies, I think the big growth is what I would call enrichment companies. Uh, Camp Broadway would be an enrichment company. It's, um, there is, I, I will say that we were one of the first musical theater enrichment companies, but now they're all across America. Um, 
And I think that's where a lot of actors who have, um, who by the time they hit 30, they're either, they're, they're wanting to think about their lifestyle differently. So they're creating after school programs. Um, you have retired teachers that are starting after school programs and summer school programs. So there's a wonder, another wonderful book I'll recommend by Stacy Wolf, and it's called um, Beyond Broadway, The Promise and Potential of Musical Theater in America. And it's all about the, the um, how camps have literally helped build the audience because so many kids are doing musicals at their camp. That's how they're, that's their first exposure to singing and dancing. So there's, I'll leave you with this. There's a lot, there's a growing body of research now that people are taking seriously that says the arts is a good thing for kids to be exposed to. The second thing is that the national standards are providing a framework for investment and technology to help service and support the um, having artists, whether they be live or digital or lesson plans, all of that content that helps fuel that interest, that's in its infancy. And I think there's going to be an explosion of that in the next 10 years. That's my going to be the last thing I do on this earth. And I think that there's, you know, that movie stars and TV artists are going across platform. So the, the, the universe is conspiring to help us. And we just have to help it move forward. And so I hope that everybody's really optimistic about this is a time for optimism and strategy and collaboration. This isn't the time to be pessimistic. We have everything to be excited about. We're going to end on that note. Thank and, you. And a note of, of optimism. And I'm just Robin, going to go. Robin, a real pleasure. Thank you. And I really look forward to seeing you all in person. Well, thank you. And um, give me a second because I'm going to wind up for YouTube. I want to thank everybody uh, in the room. I want to thank Susan for being here with, with us. Um, appreciation to my true community for coming in every week and being part of this. And if you're out there, as I said earlier, if you want to be part of the room, if you want to be in here and ask your questions, um, email me because I can make that happen. Email trunltd at aol.com t-r-u-n-l-t-d at aol.com. Um, the other thing I want to let you guys know is that this started as this, we've been talking a lot about service. Um, this was a this was done as a community service. Uh, we started this because people were going nuts being alone in quarantine. And uh, it's grown um, in 231 consecutive weeks into something that I think is, you know, a little bit more, um, a little broader than, than it was at first. We're talking about um, things that I think are, are useful um, in, in a real world that's not in quarantine. Uh, and if you want to help us keep doing this, you know, this is a pay what you can situation. And so you can pay nothing if you don't need, if you don't feel like you can pay something. That's, but if you can pay something, the other part of that is we can always use the support. Uh, and if you want to give us a donation, um, then go to true donate, tru donate.com, tru donate.com. And um, when you come in and, and join us, instead of the zero, click the $8 or click whatever you want uh, and just keep us going, please. Uh, that's it. Uh, we'll be back next week with, with Tim Kashani. We're going to talk about today was the, Tim, was the future yeah. of theater. Oh, you know, yeah. Tim? Yes. Oh, yeah, very much. We're going to be talking about AI next week. So uh, we're going to be talking, we're keeping our eye on the future, <laughs> let's just say. So uh, so join us next week and in the weeks to come. Um, I'm probably going to keep doing this till I drop. I don't know. So um, I appreciate uh, the support from the community and I appreciate all of you out there who are watching us. Um, come back, tell your friends about it and do me a favor. Tell young people about theater and, and see if you can get them interested in it. Um, we need to spread the word. Theater's a good thing. Theater's fun. Yes.